If you'll turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 5, that's where we're going to rest for the day. And as usual when I preach, that's not where I'm going to start. We're going to take a look this week at what I have titled, Don't Squash the Woolly Bear. Now, for those of you who were here last week, you understand what that means. Okay, Pastor talked about the woolly bear ca uh, caterpillar, and my wife reminded me that it doesn't turn into a butterfly, it turns into a moth. So I'm going to ask for forgiveness beforehand if I say butterfly when I shouldn't. <laughs> I've titled it, Don't Squash the Woolly Bear. As we go along, you'll understand why. And what I want to take a look at today is that having a right relationship with God means that we must have right relationships with each other as his image bearers. Squashing the woolly bear or hurting other people violates God's heart, and it actually damages the image bearer. So if we could all stand, I know we don't normally do that, but if we could stand for the reading of the word of the Lord. I'm going to start us off today in the 51st Psalm, verses 10 through 17. Psalm 51, verses 10 through 17. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from bloodshed, O God. O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praises. For you have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give you a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. Let's bow our heads. Father, as we enter into your word this morning, I just pray that you would open up our hearts, you would open up our minds, you would help us to understand the importance of of the relationships that we're supposed to have one with another, especially in and amongst your people, the Church of God, but with every human being on this planet. I pray, Father, that you would stir our hearts to understand where Jesus was going when he started this, but I say to you, section of the Sermon on the Mount. I ask, Lord, that you would bring your spirit here now, that you would use me in the way that you see fit, that the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart will be pleasing to you, Lord that the things that we hear today that we could take away, that we, we could use them this week, that we could be in prayer about them, Lord, and that we could be figuring out what it is you have for each of us in each situation that we have with the people that we deal with every day. And Lord, before we settle into your word, I just want to lift up Pastor Mike Creasel, the pastor at CBC down in Burlington, as he was brought to the hospital last night again just with an infection as he's going through chemo. Lord, I just pray your healing upon him right now in the name of Jesus, that you would, your strength would be within his body, that his immune system, Lord, would be strengthened, that the doctors would be anointed to be able to care for him, the nurses would be anointed to be able to care for him, that they would know what it is they're supposed to do, that you would bring protection upon him, upon Diana, upon his kids, his church, his, his congregation as a whole, Lord, that you would look over them. We thank you for Patty and for Dawn as they are continuing to move on and healing in the areas that they have had illness. And for Deb, I pray your blessing upon her. I ask, Father, that anybody within our body now that is suffering or struggling, that you would just speak to their hearts, that you would touch them, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would come, that you would anoint them, and that you would bring a peace and a joy that surpasses all understanding, and that you would bring the healing power of the Holy Spirit into their lives. We give you thanks for your word. We give you thanks again for a beautiful day, for the house that you have provided for us to meet in, and for the time that we have together. We give you thanks and we give you praise, Lord, for Pastor Roland and for Suzanne as they are vacationing down in North Carolina and celebrating the marriage of their son. We ask that you refresh our pastor and his wife, that they would take time to just rejoice in creation and in their son's marriage and in their new daughter-in-law and in the fun that they can have down in the Carolinas, Lord. Just bless them. Bring them back to us, Lord, completely refreshed. And we ask all of this, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. We see it every single day. There's no avoiding it. Just turn your TV on. Look at the news. Watch online or listen to the radio. We live in a world where chaos seems to be the order of the day. Stories of war, bombings, and uprisings. Politicians bad-mouthing one another and claiming to have answers 
to the questions they think everybody's asking but nobody's really asking. One person gets angry at another and all of a sudden we find out that they had skeletons in the closet and they're now dancing in the streets and they're on the evening news. The person, that opposition that offended you so bad has been taken care of, embarrassed into silence or submission. Names are thrown around intended specifically to hurt the other person as much as possible. Reality shows where families find themselves for a half an hour or an hour in the evening that we can watch on TV taking joy in showing the whole world just how dysfunctional and hurtful they can be to one another. Ratings seem to soar the more bizarre the behavior becomes within these families and the meaner their attitudes are towards one another. But it doesn't end there, not on TV. You see, these things happen every day in our lives among people we know, even with people we love. Anger, harsh words, homes that break apart, families that split up, Moms and dads that no longer find ways to be civil to each other. Love turns into hate. Hate turns into bitterness, and bitterness turns into unforgiveness. People hold long grudges all their life where the reasons for them have been long lost to time. You see, it all started when one son in the family decided to join the wrong side of the war. Despised by an uncle for reasons lost to time and family lore, this young man returned home and under suspicious circumstances was found dead. And for the next 30 years, border wars and land wars, fights over livestock and marriages to the wrong people, this crazy feud went on and on and on and on. When all was said and done and the dust cleared, four Hatfields and seven McCoys had been killed over a 32-year period. What is probably most well-known feud in American history. Angry, bitter, hard hearts over who knows what set in motion an entire generation of squashing the woolly bear. The lack of value found within brother, sister, and family members was palpable in those families. It never mattered if anyone wanted to make nice and settle things. Each family demanded justice. They would either have it in a lock whore or they would find it on their own. You see, devaluing the image bearer, as I'm calling it today, squashing the woolly bear, seems to be the chaotic way of the world in which we live in. But the section we begin this morning in the Sermon on the Mount tackles these very issues. Just what does a restored and renewed life look like? Just what happens when we walk through that door of justice that Pastor Rowan's been talking about and straight into the heart of mercy that God has? And what are we to do with that mercy when it's given to us? Most especially when we don't deserve it. You see, over the past few weeks, we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount and seeing Jesus define what it means to be the true people of God. And one of the key points which Pastor has touched upon a couple of different times is the door that's marked justice on the outside. And when open, we walk in and we find the mercy of God waiting to be given to us. And as we look into this next section here in Matthew, Jesus is defining. He is not redefining as though the law was wrong. He is defining just how the commands of the law would look like when lived out by true kingdom people. This is what it looks like when we are merciful. This is what it looks like when we as the people of God are pure in heart. This is what it looks like finally when we as the people of God are the peacemakers. Now, we have time to look at just the first one this morning because it's a huge section. But next week, we're going to take a break as it's Father's Day, and we're going to venture off into another part of Scripture, and the pastor's going to be back in two weeks, and we're going to return back here to the Sermon on the Mount. But as usual, when we read Scripture, Jesus always tackles the biggest issues first, and he goes right away to the Sixth Commandment. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, he says this, You have heard that it was said of the, to those of ancient times, You shall not murder and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. And I find it very interesting that Jesus starts here in that particular spot because it's out of order for the commandments. But it makes perfect sense in the context of God's overarching story. But it's still very interesting. You see, the first order of business, it seems, for the people of God is to reestablish God's good created order. And the first thing is valuing the image bearer. See, what Jesus is really saying to his hearers then and to us now is this. Listen, if you want to get anything right, you have to figure out this one first. God's image bearers cannot go about hurting each other 
and still think that God will be okay with them. It's just not going to work that way. Our relationships with each other have to be right if we want a right relationship with God the Father. You see, the law was very clear. You don't kill anyone. That was simple enough, and for those who follow the law, even for those of us who don't follow the law, it is, after all, easily defined. Everyone knew what taking a life looked like, and in God's eyes, it's wrong. But as usual, Jesus always puts a wrench in the works as he starts what I call the but I say to you statements in the Sermon on the Mount. You see, because the law was more than just a superficial action or a box that were to be checked, so I can go home, sit at the dinner table, grab onto the edges, smile at my wife, as we all do, and let her know that it was a bad day, but honey, at least I didn't kill anybody. <laughs> now you all laugh, but you've had those days. We've all had those days. The law, as it was always intended to be, friends, was a matter of the heart, not a matter of checking a box. In Matthew 5.22, he defines what murder in God's sight really looks like. And he says this, But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, if you, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. I don't like those words. Harsh. I didn't write them so I can read them. This was not a new thing. Jesus is addressing something that goes all the way back to the beginning. All the way back in Genesis 4, there was a struggle for the heart, and God pleaded with Cain. God wants him to see that how he feels inside will turn into something bigger if he doesn't master it. At this point in the story, it was time for, the, for the Cain and Abel to bring their offerings to God. And Cain brought his first fruits of the harvest, and his brother Abel brought the first fruits of the flock. And the scripture tells us that God looked with favor upon Abel's offering, but he didn't look with favor upon Cain's. And that upset Cain. And it's very clear why if we take a look at the scripture. His heart wasn't right. He became bitter, and God actually challenged him. God did not smite him and put a crater in the ground. He challenged him. The scriptures tell us in Genesis 4, verses 6 through 7, the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is lurking at the, at the door. It desire, its desire is for you. But you must master it. There's the challenge. Anyone who's read the story knows that he didn't master it. And it goes on to tell the sad ending as Cain murders his brother. The first recorded murder in Scripture. What ended in violence started with a heart issue. Cain allowed pride in his own desires to get in the way of doing what was right in the eyes of God. So God challenged him to look deeper and understand that his heart was what was at stake here. It wasn't about the offering. Not what you brought to the altar. And this is important for us to understand if we really want to get a hold of what Jesus is saying. So, number one, just what does a restored and renewed life look like? Well, one of the issues Jesus was dealing with in his time was the nationalistic hearts of the people of Israel. And I want you to hear this. They thought that in order to usher in the kingdom of God, that a renewed zeal and a deeper observance of the Torah or the Bible was necessary. That an absolute separation and standing against the enemy and a hatred of all those things and people who stood in opposition to Israel and the temple would actually please God. I would challenge the notion that at some level we sometimes do the same thing even still today. All of that stuff was what they thought would make God happy and then give, he would then give them back their kingdom and their rightful place. But what Jesus is doing here is defining what changes hearts and true kingdom people, what they look and what they act like. It's about the deep issues of our heart. It's not enough to be satisfied with knowing that you didn't physically squash the woolly bear today. You need to stop thinking and speaking in a manner that wounds the spirits of those who bear God's image. That's what Jesus is saying. So I want you to picture this. You've walked three days from Galilee, which is in the northern part of Israel, and you've trucked yourself all down with your family to go to Jerusalem. You get to the temple. You've picked out your lamb and your turtle dove for the sacrifice. 
And then you get yourself, you go through all the rituals necessary so you can make yourself ceremonially clean to get into the temple so you can offer these sacrifices. And while you're walking to the altar, you get your lamb over your shoulders and you've got your turtle dove in your hands and you're walking up to the altar and all of a sudden your spirit starts to stir. And in that moment, the Holy Spirit speaks to you. See, Jesus puts it this way. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there at the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister and then come and offer your gift. Now what do you do with that? To literally walk that journey to reconcile with your brother and sister back then meant you dumped everything at the altar. You walked three days to go figure out how to make it right with somebody back in the village and then three days back to the altar so that you could offer your sacrifices. But you see, that's how important it is for us to understand how important it is to God's heart that our hearts are right. You see, in Matthew 18, Jesus says again that if we offend or if we are offended, we are to go to the person and we're to make it right. No matter what it takes, we need to make every attempt to reconcile in situations where we have been wronged or somebody else is wronged or we have wronged someone else. However, there's some deeper th- something deeper here, and it has to do with setting creation, as I said, back in order by revaluing God's image bearers. It's more about you and me than it is about the things we do. It's very clear from scriptures that we cannot have a right relationship with God whom we do not see if we do not have a right relationship with those whom we do see. We are not to demand our justice and our rights. My rights, my rights, my rights. We're not to do that. We are to, at all costs, if at all possible, seek reconciliation and restoration instead. That's what happens when the restored kingdom of in the restored kingdom of God when his people function as they should. What are we to do? We don't need to walk three days, that's for sure. I hope not. If you do, call me, I'll give you a ride. But if right relationships are that important to God our Father, then we should take seriously what we ought to be doing with our lives today. Being restored and renewed means doing things differently. We have seen what the chaos of damaging image bearers does to this world. Pushing a rope doesn't get us anywhere. Being restored and renewed means doing things differently. Our rights are no longer the most important thing. You see, pride, getting our own way, and the need for justice can never get in the way of mercy. It seems weird. I don't like it. I'm pretty certain most of us don't like it. For a takeaway, what I would say here is that don't let our pride get in the way of God's mercy over people. Not only does it hinder our growth, it harms others. So what happens when we walk through the door of justice and straight into the heart of mercy? Well, this is important. You see, Pastor focused a good deal on this door because this is where our desire to have what we want meets God's demand for restoration. And there can be a conflict there if we let it. On God's side of the door, we receive mercy instead of justice, and our hearts are restored and actually born again. What is being made clear through the Sermon on the Mount is that God is challenging us to walk as his restored people in this world. This isn't some existential text where we hope we can attain to this. This is what it looks like when the kingdom of God is actually working. That's why when justice meets mercy, funny things tend to happen. James tells us in his letter, For the one who said, You shall not commit adultery, also said, You shall not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but if you murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. If we are to truly be the people of God, we need to extend mercy and forgiveness to those who seek it. Even if we don't think they deserve it. Remember that we didn't deserve it either. All of us have people in our lives who hurt us or drive us crazy. Is that an accurate statement? Don't look at the person and don't raise your hand. Okay? 
I always try to remind myself, honestly, that more often than not, I'm the person driving somebody crazy. There are times when I've hurt people. So I try to extend grace and mercy as hard as it is because I'm a stubborn man. Because I know that I am somebody's problem. So when I'm thinking somebody's my problem, grace and mercy tends to work those things out. If God has so valued us and giving us undeserved mercy, shouldn't we be doing all we can to be Christ-like with the woolly bears in our life? I mean, we've been before the judge's bench and have been declared free and not guilty. Shouldn't we pay that gift forward? Why hoard it for ourselves? So really, it's no surprise that Jesus frames this whole thing out in the terms of a law court. And he says in the 25th and 26th verse, come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're on the way to the court or on the way to court with him. Or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you will be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid every last penny. My question to you is, once you're in prison, how do you earn a penny? You don't. So how long is it going to take you to get out? Forever. So the intent is don't get there. We instantly think that with reading what Jesus is saying is if someone is going to drag you into court, it's really best to settle it all out before you get there. And that is true. I mean, it's pretty clear that there comes a point when our actions become so out of line that we may very well find ourselves being dragged into court before a judge. It takes just a couple minutes in front of the TV to see that circus. It happens. But I want to look at it on a deeper level, and I'll be honest with you, I don't really think I'm too far off here, especially in light of what James has told us, because we have received mercy instead of justice from our Creator. We need to extend that to others. If we don't extend it to those who ask for it, we squash the woolly bear. We devalue the image bearer whom the Creator values more than my right to remain angry and unforgiving. The restored people of God living in new creation have no right to hold grudges and have no right to withhold mercy. I can't get around that. We have no right to hold grudges. How many of us do? We have no right to withhold mercy. How many of us actually do that? These are hard things. The whole point that Jesus is making here is that we commit murder in the truest sense of God's law when we act towards others in a way that does not reflect His mercy. That's what he's saying. God's law is to be written on our heart. One of the saddest things here is that in acting unjustly towards others and unmerciful, we actually harm ourselves in the long run. And I don't think we get that. You see, our growth in Christ can only go as far as we let it and as far as our unforgiveness allows us to go. Cain's decision not to listen to God not only cost Abel his life, it cost Cain his life before God. So takeaway number two for this week, listen, as you forgive, so you have been forgiven. So let's flip that around. Because you have been forgiven, so ought we to forgive. It's been extended very freely to us. We need to learn and figure out how to extend it very freely to everybody else. If we have walked through the door and into God's mercy, our job is to share that blessing. So what are we to do with the mercy when it's actually given to us? We tend to just hole up. Be there separate and come out of them. Build your little city on a hill. It's not what we're supposed to do. We pay it forward. We don't squash the woolly bear. At some point, we were a woolly bear in somebody's life, and thank God we weren't stepped on. We were allowed to grow as, as a pain as we were, because every one of us were kids, and I'm sure our parents at some point wanted to take us out and make another one look just like us. <laughs> every one of us. But grace was afforded, so we don't squash the woolly bear. This entire section of the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus taking the commands of the law and showing us how they provide a clear roadmap for us going forward. You see, it's, it's the way of being a fully restored and genuine human being. That's what it's about. He digs down deep into our spirits and demands a radical new way of doing life. Life as it was intended to be from the very beginning. 
but has gone awry and on its own way since the fall. You see, this isn't about Jesus fulfilling the law, putting it aside nice and conveniently over in the corner because we blew it and we're going to go with plan B. No. It was always the intention for him to fulfill the law. Putting it aside. But giving us new rules of conduct? No. We were and are created in his image and from the very beginning we are supposed to live lives that are fruitful and bring glory to God. One of the most important ways we do that is to love each other. Moses wrote this in Genesis 1, 27th verse. God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. You bear his image. That's valuable. That's powerful. I don't care where you are. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what you're going through. We all muck it up every day. <laughs> but Scripture says you bear his image. John, in his first letter to the church, said this. See what love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are because we bear his image. You see, woolly bear caterpillars can only become tiger moths if they survive the caterpillar stage. The mass carnage of I-89 as they try to find their way across that interstate. And you got little green gut spots all over the place. Or the squashing everyone you find in the wood pile at your house because you just don't like caterpillars. Stops the potential moth from ever being. The cycle ends there. On a very practical level, we have to have those changed hearts that God calls us to. Jesus said, out of the overflow of the heart, our mouths speak. He addressed anger and insults as those things which wound, hurt, and divide in such a way that the law defines it as murder. It was never intended again to be that way. In the beginning, before the fall, Adam and Eve lived in perfect harmony in the garden. An absolute miracle in and of itself. But they lived in perfect harmony in the garden. But God's plan since the fall has been to restore his people back to the way it was supposed to be. So I close with two things. First, Pastor and I talked about this message this week. He made a very interesting comment in my office that struck me. I really don't think that he even noticed that he said it, but it just struck me. We were talking about these caterpillars and how he finds them throughout his woodpile, you know, as we're trying to map out the sermon for this week. And he went on, as any of you know Pastor Roland closely, went on in a very nice, quiet way as we were talking about how he gently picks them up, each one of them, as he finds them in his woodpile. And he moves them to a safe place and puts them down and then continues to move the wood. Why does he do that? So they won't get squashed. What a picture. What a picture of a tender heart. It's a caterpillar. But there's value there. There's no need to bring harm. A helpless creature being helped simply because they have value. There's a deep lesson for us all in that when we look at each other as human beings. You see, because every human being is in a different stage struggling with different things in their life. I want you to think, what are you having a hard time with? Or, let me rephrase that. I want you to think, who are you having a hard time with? We have a lot of what's in our life that we're having a hard time with, but none of us really look deeply at the who we just want to... Again, you laugh because you feel the same way. Think about that. In your life, who is it that just drives you crazy? You know what? Sometimes the person that rubs you the wrong way may very well be that mirror reflecting back to you the things that drive you crazy in your own life. And that's why they're rubbing you the wrong way. So how do you tackle that one? 
instead of getting angry and squashing that woolly bear, woolly bear and putting them in their place and letting them have it and letting them know that that kind of behavior is wrong, all the while manifesting that same behavior, perhaps we can pick them up in a way that magnifies our creator and validates them as the image bearer that they are. That takes work. Helping them somehow to move a few steps forward on their journey. Because I'll tell you, the scriptures are real clear. In doing that, you're helping yourself as well. When I do that, I help myself as well. I grow more when I sit down after I've had a massive brain fart moment and I say sorry. I grow more when I realize that I'm doing things that I ought not to do and I'm confronted by the people in my lives. Hey, you know, you got to cut it out. I don't always jump right on that bandwagon and go, you know, you're right. No. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. No. Sometimes there's an argument. But then I realize, you know, they're telling me that because they want me to move forward. So my challenge to you is, in helping somebody else, you're actually helping yourself because you're valuing an image bearer and therefore being revalued yourself. So if I can have the worship team come down here, please, and we can start just playing quietly in the background. The challenge that we have is to understand that each one of us is in the woolly bear stages of being fully human. Okay? So some of you are freaked out by caterpillars. Most of you would just soon step on them or hit them with a hammer. I get that. But if we take a look at this from the point of view of being an image bearer, what does it really look like for us as the people of God? Well, the second thing I want to close with, which is your third takeaway, St. Paul challenges those who have been raised with Christ in his letter to the church in Colossae to be different. Now, I love and hate St. Paul. I really do. Okay, because, you know, there's no getting around the things that he says. You try to read it six different ways and seven different ways, and he's just so cut to the chase and blunt. So this is what he writes. As God's holy word, it is for us today as much as it was for the church then. So he said it better than any one of us could. Takeaway number three. If you're taking notes, it's Colossians, the third chapter, verses 8 to 15. I want you to meditate on it this week. If you've heard nothing, this is the scripture. Pray through it. Ask God to help you in the areas you most struggle with. Get it into your spirit and into your hearts because this is what he says. But now you must get rid of all such things. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another. Seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourself with the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. In the renewal, there is no longer Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free. But Christ is all and is in all. Now, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, that's you, that's me. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body. And be thankful. If we could bow our heads, if I could have the worship team, I not the worship team, but the prayer team come down. Father, there comes a point in all of our lives where we just simply struggle. We don't really know how to handle different things or people in our lives. We don't know how to handle the stuff that really eats away at us. I just pray as we are in this time, Lord, in your place and in your presence, your word is meant to edify the body of believers. Your word is meant to show us the areas that you want to challenge us as our Father to grow so that we can become more fully human. 
I just pray that you would begin to stir in the hearts of all of us here. Lord, show us those areas and those people that we struggle with the most, that we harbor unforgiveness, that we harbor bitterness, and that we hold anger against, and we really don't even know why anymore because it's just been so long. But I just pray, Lord, with heads bowed and eyes closed, if, if this is an area that you are really struggling with, I would challenge you. But I want to pray with you before I go to the back of the church. If you would just put your hand up so I can see it and acknowledge that. But if this is an area you struggle with, yes, I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, all over. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Father, I just ask that you would just pour your spirit into the hearts of those folks who put their hands up for that, Lord that you would bring healing in that area where there is unforgiveness or there is anger or there is bitterness, whatever it may be, whether it's against you or it's against someone in their lives, Lord, that you would just bring that right up to the front so that it can be laid at your cross, so that freedom can be had in Christ, that we can have fixed hearts and changed hearts. If you've never brought your heart through that door of justice, either because you're afraid or because you've never felt that call and that pull of the Holy Spirit. I'm just going to open my eyes with heads bowed and eyes closed. If you feel today's the day that you want to go through that door of justice and encounter the heart of God's mercy, if you could just put your hand up, I want to pray for you right now. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Eight. Father, I just pray for everybody that's put their hands up right now that they would put themselves right in front of the, jo the door that is labeled justice. That you would give them the courage through your Holy Spirit to be able to turn that doorknob and understand that waiting on the other side of that is the mercy of Almighty God that was purchased and paid for on the cross through your Son. Father, I pray that in their quiet way that they would come before you. That they would confess before you that they need your heart of mercy to replace that heart of justice and that hard heart that says, I don't know exactly what it is I want, Lord, but I'm going to fight for mine. Replace that heart with the tender heart of Jesus that says, forgive. I belong to you. You have made it right for me. Give them that heart, Lord, that is born again in Christ because of the work that he did on the cross. Receive them, Lord, that they may receive you. Father, I just pray now as we would all just stand. As the worship team leads us in the song of how he loves us, I would encourage you, especially those who have raised hands, that you don't leave here today without coming down being prayed for, being anointed. Pray with each other, even in the pews. If you see somebody who's in need or in hurting, he loves every one of us right where we are. We are all on that journey. Bring us, Lord, into your presence so that as we experience your mercy, we can all go out understanding that you are sending us out into the world as kingdom people, doing things completely different that have ever been done before so that people can see the heart of God and the mercy of God through the justice that was brought to bear on the cross and the victory that we had in the resurrection. We give you thanks.